It's Anonymous MD with Dr. T. Um, and Lisa. Dr. T brings the real and refreshing insights, straightforward, evidence-based, and up-to-date. Now here's the doctor and Lisa. All right, and we're back. What episode is this, Lisa? Oh, gosh, Dr. T, I think it's episode nine, if I'm not mistaken. I think it's episode 10, actually. Is it? I Did I miss so. it? You know what? I'm not even going to be hard on myself about it because keeping Don't track be. of days and times is too much right now. It so is getting challenging. I'm showing up weekly. Sure. That's it. That's, That's right. enough. That's right. Yeah. Well, I mean, 10 a milestone. So it is. Uh, congratulations. Realize. Thank you. Are you buying me paper or silver? I'll buy you stationery. I know you like stationery. Yeah, I do. I'll get you some yeah. stationery. Yeah. Great. So Again, we're going to continue our series with another incredible guest today who we're going to introduce in just a couple minutes. Uh, but first, let's do our usual routine and let's talk about numbers that don't really matter. Actually, our guest today gave us a great word. They show us trends. That's right. They don't really give us any information about what's going on right now. Um, so, All right, you give know, them if. To us. All right, let me give them to you. So yeah. uh, almost 5 million cases worldwide reported. That's most likely underreported. That's the general mm -hmm. consensus. And 323,000 reported deaths as of mm -hmm. today. Uh, and since our guest today is a geriatrician who takes care of our elderly population, uh, we thought a good comparison would be the number of new cases of dementia per year worldwide. And that number is 10 million new cases per year. So we're starting again to see that this COVID pandemic is actually um, having quite an effect. If, if not a healthcare effect, definitely in terms of the societal effects, mm -hmm. uh, although we don't want to minimize the healthcare effects that it's having. So without further ado, We'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Fiona Menzies. She's the head of geriatric medicine at St. Joseph's Health Center in Toronto. And she's been in practice for seven years. And she also lectures at the University of Toronto, which is great. We're so, so lucky to have her lecturing here for us today. Yeah, welcome, that's right. Dr. Menzies. Thank you, guys. How are you today? Pretty good. Yeah. So usually, you know, before we get into the meat of the matter, we, we like to give our guests an opportunity to um, highlight any philanthropic organizations that are helping make the community better, especially given the circumstances these days. Yeah, I like I, good, right? So that's, that's wonderful. Sorry. Dr. Yeah, Menzies, no, no, I like that term highlight. I wanted to, to give a shout out to West Toronto Support Services. They're a community agency that does a lot for seniors and they are still continuing to give amazing care to seniors during the pandemic. And then I think you mentioned that they, they do things like Meals on Wheels yeah. and they have uh, community programs uh, for patients with dementia, although um, they've become more like friendly telephone programs yes. as opposed to visits these days. Yeah. And um, I, I guess this is an important point to highlight is that we have to remember that not all of our elderly are in seniors homes or long-term mm -hmm. care facilities. Many of them, they, they're at home uh, and they are uh, living their lives there at home, but with certain difficulties. And, and so we have to keep them in mind always. Um, and uh Dr. Benzie, was it, there, there was another organization you mentioned, the, the Unity West LTC Plus. Can you tell us a little bit about that as well? Because that sounds like such a wonderful program as well. Yeah, sure. It's uh, an it's a outreach a team, um, which has some support from the Lynn and St. Joe's. We are a collection of internists and geriatricians who are trying to provide medical help to physicians in long-term care homes uh, for patients that... Uh, they are trying to avoid transfer to hospital or help facilitate that. So important, both such an important organization. Thank you for sharing those with us. What do you think, Lise? Should we talk about some uh, some COVID-19 is as it applies to our geriatric population? I think that is extremely important because I think it's really affecting them a lot. And I'm not going to take what Dr. Menzies has to say, but I really am interested to, to get into this a little bit more. So why don't we just go general and ask you, Dr. Menzies, um, you know, what are 
some of the key points that we need to keep in mind during this COVID-19 era when we're, we're talking about our elderly population? I think it all boils down to frailty. And this is like really showing me as a geriatrician, <laughs> we, right. we love this term, but it is mm -hmm. a bit confusing because it is a term the general population uses all the time. So if you see someone who looks perhaps a little thin, a little unsteady in their feet, uh, we have a habit of saying, oh, they're very frail. But for me as a geriatrician, when I say someone's very frail, I'm thinking back to the clinical frailty scale. Shout out to Canada. It's, uh, it was pioneered and developed by Ken Rockwood at Dalhousie University in Halifax. Very cool. Um, and I, we need to see, is this person frail because it's a temporary condition? And in fact, they're not frail at baseline or is it because they have a lot of comorbidities and they have some issues with their walking, mobility problems, and in fact, they have a high likelihood of dying in the next year, which we know from uh, Dr. Rockwood's uh, work is associated with severe frailty. Um, if you look at the NICE guidelines that came out, it's like the quickest guidelines ever um, for COVID in, um, uh, I think they came out March 20th. They, they re highly recommend stratifying patient care by the clinical, the clinical frailty scale. Um, so again, uh, the idea being we shouldn't go by someone's age. We need to see what kind of comorbidity and what frailty are they uh, before determining what treatment they should have. So in terms of, you know, just maybe dumbing it down a little bit, if we're talking about uh, you know, somebody maybe in their 50s who has a number of comorbidities might be extremely frail, whereas maybe there's a 95-year-old, for example, there's one in an 85-year-old in my yoga class who out yoga on a That's weekly lovely. basis when I'm allowed to be there. Yeah. Um, and I assume that her frailty is, is much lower than maybe that 55-year-old with comorbidities. And Yeah. And she's okay. working hard to keep it keep it. She is. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, I mean, I would say if she's doing yoga, probably she's not frail at all. She's what we would call managing well or uh, not not even frail. Um, sorry, I'm on call. So of course, oh, that's that okay. would get a call that's during right. this. <laughs> this, is, this is great for our listeners to understand that, you know, we're not just doing this podcast as physicians, but we're actually uh, in the middle of our clinical work and, and finding the time to do this. And uh, we think that's that's how important we think that this is to get this message across. Um, you know, one thing I would I would ask is just in general, what what are some of the parameters that this this frailty scale looks at um, to indicate how frail someone actually is? So a lot of it is mobility. So we're not wrong when we see someone who can't walk well and think, oh, they're looking frail. Uh, and it's also just activities in, so in medicine, we like saying activities of daily living or instrumental right. activities, but it's just what someone's able to do. And I, I think this is geriatrics in general. If you think about what's normal and what are, should you be able to do, like most of us get dressed in the morning, we're able to make our breakfast or lunch or dinner, um, walk to uh, wherever we're going to go for the day. If someone's not able to do that, what's that about? Is right. it they're severely depressed and again, it's a transient, a transient state or is it because they have severe dementia and they're no longer able to put together initiative and plan uh, to carry out these activities? Um, need to, I, I, I like to, to always go back to think about, well, should this person be able to do that or not? Right. And then when you said death, transient state there with depression, just for our listeners, you're referring to something that's possibly reversible, something that we could very you much know, provide so yeah. counseling and, yeah. and, and uh, maybe some medications. But we had a mental health series earlier on and talked about cognitive behavioral therapy. So um, very important to understand, you know, what is progressive and what do we not have a cure for or a solution for? And, yeah. and what do we have solutions for if we can identify uh, those conditions properly? Um, so uh, for uh, the geriatric population, I spend a lot of time talking about delirium versus dementia. Right. And the wonderful thing about delirium is it is reversible, right? right. And, and, and I always sort of start that off as there's hope this is going to clear up. Sometimes it takes time. 
uh, but it, it is that is the key thing that makes it different from dementia. We don't have a cure for dementia, but we do know some things that can help slow progression. And they're also the same things that we know can prevent dementia in the first place. So exercise, the person going to do yoga is keeping her mobility, uh, but she's also building her resilience against dementia, also keeping her immune system strong as well as a, like That's a side fascinating. thing. Um, but also in addition to exercise is healthy diet, not smoking, protecting our brain, don't try not have any concussions. Um, things that we should all be doing anyway, uh, but That's sometimes get to uh, get missed. Yeah. And, you know, one of the other things we've been kind of talking about on the podcast, and this is my own personal opinion, is that uh, we shouldn't be so afraid of COVID that we don't go outside for our regular walks. As long as we're keeping yeah. our social distancing, you know, the analogy I like to use is, is the virus in, in open air is like a drop of soap in Lake Ontario. So, mm -hmm. you know, if you're keeping your distance from others, we can't use this COVID-19 as an excuse to stay homebound. We need to get out and we need to get the UV rays mm -hmm. and the exercise. Uh, and just that fresh air and just that 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 mental boost from being outdoors and so we have been advocating for that and uh, I guess it depends on how frail our elderly population is but if they uh, are able to go and do yoga then presumably <laughs> probably she's able to go for walks outside which uh, we should encourage that's right. So everyone has sure. their limits, right? So do the little bit that you can do. And then maybe the next day do a modicum more activity and the day after that. And we have days and days after each other right now to really get an avalanche going in terms of our activity and, and making positive change. So that applies to yeah. the elderly as much as it does to anybody who's middle-aged or young. It doesn't matter. I've been really focusing on exercise because it's something you can do even in your own house or apartment. Mm -hmm. Um, harder to have social interaction right now. Um, right. Although I have been trying to encourage the patients I'm following uh, by phone to start phoning up people. People I haven't talked to in ages, this is the time, right? Absolutely, behavioral who, therapy. Who doesn't wanna have a phone call right now, right? That's right. Do you have any stories right. of, of long lost loves reconnecting it from your patients? <laughs> I don't, I don't. Oh, well, you know what, you're gonna have to <laughs> but come that back and lovely. tell us about it. It does sound If you lovely, hear one, you better make sure you, you tell us about it. Mm -hmm. Do you know, um, I have a really sweet one. Um, I do have a, a, a patient. It's not a long last love, but it, it sort of echoes my shout out to West Toronto Support Services. She goes to a day program. She has dementia uh, and they have been following. They have been calling her every day and talking with her and keeping her spirits up. So, so, so important. Didn't we talk about that, Lisa, in earlier episodes about we instead did. of calling your, your grandparents or your elderly family members once a week for half an hour, it's maybe more useful to do it mm -hmm. every day for three to five minutes just to keep that regular consistency. Yeah. Uh, now, that's not evidence-based, but that's something that a psychiatrist we had uh, mm -hmm. on the show uh, on earlier episodes had suggested. Um, mm -hmm. So... I mean, speaking with somebody gives you all sorts of good feelings. Now, this isn't evidence-based, what I'm about to say either, but, you know, it releases good neurotransmitters. I'm pretty sure from my psychology days in yeah. undergrad. And so w why not help somebody release those good chemicals on a daily basis and give them a small dose of it rather than having them completely depleted over the six days that you don't speak to them at all? I think it makes yeah. Total sense. Yeah, very true. Yeah, the isolation is tough. It is. And... I you know, there is evidence to show if you see nature, you actually boost your immune system. There you go. Yeah, that is there. There you go. There's there's also some really cool stuff. So I think the point of what we're here is that we're seeing a higher mortality rate among patients with high frailty scales, not necessarily associated to age as much as um the, yeah. the media ties it to it just it's more of a correlate who are more advanced in age tend to have a predisposition for frailty so it's kind of one of those those uh, uh second order associations but i guess what you're saying dr menzies is you could have a very young patient with a high frailty score and they're just at uh, as mm -hmm. they have a high risk as well, just like an elderly person with a high frailty score. Yeah, very much so. It's more common to be frail when you're older, but certainly there's frail people who are in their 20s. Mm -hmm. um, 
What I think an important it's, distinction. Thank you so much to both yeah. of you. I would never have realized that. So that's why oh, I, I'm just realizing this now for the first it's, time. It's a little bit <laughs> mind blowing, you know, yeah. because all the headlines are pointing to age, age, age. And right. uh, we're not really thinking beyond that. So, wow. It's easier just to report. And it, it's just an, uh, to a certain extent, it's an arbitrary cutoff saying people over the age of 70 is higher risk, right? Right. Um, as a geriatrician, I'd like to stay away from it, but at the same time, I understand the utility of it and how mm -hmm. important it is to highlight to people to be a bit more careful if you're older. Um, there, I, I don't know if I've come in contrast with it. I, uh, there has been some talk of older people being less, um, oh, what's the a word, like being less vigilant about social distancing. Sort of mm -hmm. saying, whatever, if I get COVID, what does it matter? Sounds like uh, my dad. I've heard some anecdotal yeah, <laughs> or experienced yeah. some anecdotal. My in-laws actually well. fall in this yeah. category. I love yeah. them, but they're kind of yeah. like, whatever. <laughs> um, and, and the flip side is because they're older, but extremely healthy individuals who my father-in-law like bikes 30k every day it's kind of right. crazy but it's very good for his mental health very it keeps him busy um mm -hmm. but the flip side to that is they still do need to be a bit more careful um no dinner parties like, right. try try and video chat try and talk on the phone don't don't invite people over right what have you been experiencing in terms of um your geriatric population and their their ability to connect with their grandchildren or their great grandchildren. I mean, that's, that's yeah. something that they live their whole lives uh, to, to see happen and to watch their grandchildren grow. And now all of a sudden uh, I find a lot of um, the patients at my seniors home are, are really having a tough time that they can't have yeah. visitors uh, these days. It's a huge challenge. I, I, I really have two pots of pay or two categories of patients people who have no dementia are doing functioning really well but have maybe some issues with uh, polypharmacy or falls and then I have a group of patients who have dementia and are doing quite badly in the pandemic the group that have dementia they're really struggling because they can't do zoom um, often they're living alone or with family or older children who also can't manage Zoom if they're like 98. Right. Um, and it, people with severe dementia in particular, they find it very disorientating to have someone on a screen who's talking to them. Right. Um, it is a common delusion that the TV people are talking to them, right? Right. So now they are. You're, you're it, validating their delusion. Yeah, it's, it's crazy. It's like <laughs> wow. really oh, stressful God. for them. Um, so I've, I've done some new patient consults via Zoom and the, the child will have set it up for me. And I, I realized sort of very early on, the patient is freaking out because they're like, what's going on? Like my mm -hmm. TV is talking to me. They know my name. Right. What is this? So just something to think about. Like Zoom is not- I mean, even in, even in person, it's a challenge um, yeah. interviewing and talking to a patient with dementia. So I can't imagine when, yeah. when that personal aspect is taken away, how, how off guard they must be caught already. Yeah, I think the phone is better. The um, phone is better, I see. Because people expect to have phone calls. Right. Uh, it, it's normal way of interacting, but the, the, mm -hmm. the video conferencing, not so good for people with, or I mean, mild dementia, I think they can cope, but not moderate to severe. That's, that's an important point too, for any of our family physicians out there, if they're considering communicating uh, remotely with, uh, yeah. or any doctors out there who are communicating remotely with our patients with dementia to maybe consider phone over video uh, for that reason of not reinforcing uh, some of the delusional thoughts that so uh, can happen with dementia. Even for family members. We take yeah. it outside of the medical community and you really want to, you know, my heart is breaking over here as you're talking about this, uh, this lack of them being able to video chat or them being terrified by it um, and sending them into a spiral. Um, but for family members to be able to know what best to do, because I can imagine that if my grandmother who had dementia was still alive, my heart would be breaking um, right yeah. now and not be able to be there. Right. So um, I'm so a 99 year old grandfather. He just turned 99 last week. Um, and I, I call him, mm -hmm. uh, he sometimes thinks I'm in the backyard, mm -hmm. but that's fine. <laughs> he, he also lives in Scotland, so there's no way I'm in the backyard, but you know, <laughs> wouldn't that be nice if we were, oh, allowed to I know, right? Yeah. 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 Well, um, muzzle top to him, 99. That is, that's no, I'm going to get yeah. a letter from the queen next year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right? He, Knock he on would, wood. It would make him very happy. I, I, um, 
uh, we were actually going to fly over there, but now I'm like, we'll do it for hundreds. That'll be even more exciting. Right. right. You're right. That's even better. Yeah. That's that's a good way of looking at the positive side of it, right? Yeah. Um, there is now you mentioned um a very interesting, I guess we'll call it a care team. Mm -hmm. Um, because you know, one of the dilemmas we're now facing is that when patients uh are close to uh becoming deceased, uh pre-COVID, uh so before the pandemic we were able to have family members at their bedside, uh, which was you know, important, I'm sure, um, not just for the family members, but for the patient themselves. And now we're uh, seeing a lot of patients with critical illnesses uh, alone and quarantined. Um, so how have you guys at the G St. Joseph's Health Center been um, kind of addressing this new challenge that we face? So Jen Hoffner and I, uh, she's one of the palliative docs here, we've put together a critical illness conversation team. We do consults in-house in the hospital, but we also have an outreach team as well. And we've just recently extended it to retirement homes and also long-term care facilities. Um, it's, it's challenging to have this kind of conversation at any time. So in the middle of a pandemic, it's even more so. It's, I think, you have to be careful. Yes, we're having this conversation because of COVID, but certainly as a geriatrician, I'm having this conversation because I want to advocate for the best possible care for whoever I'm talking with, right? Um, sometimes there's been people who are not frail and I'm strongly advocating for full aggressive treatment for everything. Um, contrast though with some people who, you know, they are severely frail at baseline and, and, and perhaps a, a ICU stay is not in their best interest. Um, but it has been very successful. Um, I know some families have really found it helpful and my colleagues also have, have let us get some feedback that it's been helping things. It's got to be a really, really difficult decision for anyone to make or for a family. And so yeah. with you guys coming in as sort of neutral third parties that are um, full of information and evidence um, to help guide that decision. I, I can't imagine what a relief that is. So kudos to you. Yeah. And you know, when yeah. we talk about palliative care and geri geriatrics, and you can correct me if my understanding is wrong, is that they're separate specialties, but there are mm -hmm. some overlaps there, uh, which allow you guys to have a perspective that, and uh, to be informed and uh, understand uh, issues that uh, other physicians in the community or other specialties in the hospital may not be as privy to? It's tricky because I, I take people, I take care of people at the end of their lives a lot of times. And I do take care of people with dementia, which is a terminal illness, although very mm -hmm. slow moving and chronic, right? So it's a, it's a unique perspective. Yes. Yeah. And um, Lise, what do you think? Uh, what do you think about that type of team? for our uh, our folks out there. And I think I think it's amazing. I think it's invaluable and it's a really difficult thing for people to face is these end of life decisions. And you know what um people who get to make them are are lucky because not everyone does get the the time to sit down and and sift through choices uh, about how they want uh, to spend their final days or final moments. Um, so but it's still really really difficult and it's hard to have that perspective at that time death is scary. Mm -hmm. And not everyone handles it well. So um, I think that that's, that's amazing. Really amazing. Dr. Menzies, if you, yeah, go ahead, go I, ahead, please. I, I was just going to bring up, I, I do think maybe this is a time for all of us to think a bit more about how would we want our family members to take care of us near the end of our lives? And, you know, what's important to our family and, and what's important to us? And, and do they know that? Um, I have had this conversation with my husband and, and he actually was the one that decided we would have this conversation because I'm a little bit leery of having it. Like if I talk about this, will it, you know, somehow cause me to, um, but he is very sensible. He's a lawyer. So it different, different way of thinking mm -hmm. of things. And, mm -hmm. and, and it actually is really great. Like we had this conversation early on in our relationship and it's, it, it makes me very happy to know that he knows what my views are on these sort of things. And I think what we're referring to is what we call advanced directives. 
um, which is a very important term in uh, medicine. Uh, it includes uh, things such as whether somebody would want to be resuscitated. So that's a DNR, a do not resuscitate, which is different than uh, a do not intubate. So somebody may decide to have one and not the other, or they may decide to have both. Um, we're also talking here a little bit about who the power of attorney is for uh, a patient with dementia, who's the one making their decisions. And I just also encourage our listeners to distinguish what a power of attorney is compared to a healthcare surrogate, because they're often uh, used synonymously, although there are some differences there too. So, right. Well, then there's um, the power of attorney for personal care and then the one for property, right? So you might want yeah. two different people, depending on the strengths in your family, doing those. Exactly, exactly. Um, so, Dr. Menzies, another uh, question I had is, you know, we have a lot of, you know, this, these medications that are being politicized in, in the media. And, you know, a, at least I could say a couple of them that come to mind have been around for a very long time. Mm-hmm. Uh, we've used them for, you know, initially they were came on the market f- to treat certain uh, communicable diseases. And then we found that, you know, they may be useful in the treatment of other conditions. And, um, you know, this is common in, in the medical field that instead of inventing a brand new drug, every time we're faced with a new condition, sometimes we go back and see, okay, what do we have in the toolbox and what can (laughs) we, what can we pull out in this case? And so I, I, you know, obviously, uh, Uh, when we talk about our patients who are ending up hospitalized based on frailty, not age, which is, I think, a key point today, see a utility of uh, getting informed consent from these patients, especially if their prognosis is poor or from their decision makers, uh, to enroll them in, in randomized controlled trials whereby we start to study the effects of these medications compared to placebo. Uh, is that something that, you know, me personally, I think it's something that's very important because mm-hmm. we always want data. Um, but, you know, from your end, um, you know, kind of dealing with the elderly population, is that a discussion that you should be having with the patients and their families? Or is, is that maybe a bit insensitive? I think we should be. Uh, I really trust our Canadian medical system, and I really trust our ethics boards. If a study is being conducted here, it's going to be done properly. And I think if informed consent is properly done, there's no reason why we shouldn't be conducting these trials. We need to find a treatment for COVID, and the only way to do it properly is to do a a randomized control trial, right? Um, I will say, a lot of my patients really want to be in part of trials, uh, not not COVID, but in, just in general. Uh, I have a lot of patients that say to me, is there a trial I can be involved in? And we know that people who are a part of trials actually end up typically getting better care, even placebo arm. Right. Uh, right? Just from so, the, the, they're in contact with healthcare professionals yeah. more often and who and knows what, what else. It, yeah. yeah, that's right. That's what I was going to say. The psychological effects we never they're know. not isolated. Do. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, so advocate for evidence-based medicine, definitely. Mm -hmm. Very much so. Yep. So were there any other last points that were important for our listeners today, um, that you wanted to get across to them? We touched on this and I think you mentioned that, uh, Mark Fisher mentioned this during his podcast, please come to hospital. Or yes. call your family doctor. <laughs> and go do your blood uh, work. <laughs> yes, <laughs> there is a pandemic, but we don't have a clear end in sight. And, and I do worry about people not seeking medical help that um, they really should be getting in, and in a timely fashion too. So if, if you need help, it's there. We, we have a very clear infection control policy. We're doing our best to keep people uh, as safe as possible, even in hospital. Such good final words of advice. I mean, we've learned so much um, in this conversation. We've learned about frailty versus age. Um, And I think the question that was most important or um, most interesting to me was the the question you asked yourself of should they be able to do that or not? And I think that's where the, the frailty happens. So if they should be able to do it and they're not able to, and you have enough of those tick boxes, you know, that somebody's frail regardless of their age and that they are more at risk of having um, uh, 
not a great outcome from COVID if they get it. Um, and I think that, of course, what's important is to know um, what the elderly people in your life need in terms of uh, contact. They need a video. Do the, would phone be preferable? And to make sure that everybody is getting the care they need from amazing teams like yours who really know what they're talking about. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And, you know, one last point just to, again, emphasize that we keep hearing about peaks from COVID, but we need to worry about peaks uh, from the thousands and thousands of other medical conditions that mm -hmm. may be going unchecked. And I can tell you anecdotally um, that definitely there is a lot more tentativeness going to labs, going to imaging suites and, and uh, going to the hospital. So this is an extremely important message um, that we don't want people to, to arrive to the emergency room uh, because of decompensation of other medical yeah. conditions that are going unchecked. So I yeah. think that that's a very important point as well. Mm -hmm. What a pleasure. Oh, it's been really nice to talk with you such guys too. It was such, such a, a such an informative uh, episode. Mm -hmm. Oh, lovely. And then once you hear back from uh, your patients about all of the people they've reconnected with and, you know, flame or otherwise, whatever, old enemies even, I don't care if we're going to have you back on, you can tell us about it. That would be really lovely, wouldn't it? Yes. Yeah. And also if, if you have any new perspectives or any new uh, information that is, is coming out of your work that you're doing there uh, in the community and at the hospital and um, uh, through the academia, please uh, let us know and we'd love to have you back. Oh, amazing. Um, I'd love to be to, back. To Thank update you. Us. Yeah, we're just, uh, we're so excited that uh, we had you here today. Obviously, the geriatric mm -hmm. population is um, especially dear to my heart. I know it's very dear to Lisa's heart. Mm -hmm. And um, I know Dr. Menzies, just from the work that you've done in the community, mm -hmm. that um, your compassion towards that population is uh, second to none. So we, we just really thank you for everything you're mm -hmm. doing. And obviously your phone uh, was an indicator that you're on call and, um, right. you know, oh dear. we have to keep in mind <laughs> our front, okay. frontline healthcare workers, uh, physicians, nurses, social workers, respiratory therapists, uh, personal support workers, occupational therapists, physiotherapists, dietitians, mm -hmm. all the people who clean the hospital and the sanitary departments. These are all heroes uh, and they all deserve to be acknowledged. Oh, yeah, very much so. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, we'll leave it with that. Thank you we'll so much. Take okay. care, everybody. We'll see you guys next week. Thank you, you Dr. Menzies. Week. We hope to have you back. Sounds good. All right. All right. Bye, everybody. Take care. Bye. 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 Thanks for listening to the show. Subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast. On YouTube, smash that bell. That's a notification button. Anytime the doctor knows something, so will you. Stay healthy. See you next time.